The text that's before us, interestingly, was uh, the text that well-known preacher D.L. Moody preached from uh, just uh, about a month before his passing. How many of you are familiar with the name D.L. Moody? Would you raise your hand? Most of us are. Moody preached his last message from this passage November, I think, 23rd, 1899, and then he died December 22nd, 1899. And he said, shortly before his passing, he said, Never have I wanted to lead men and women to Christ as much as I do at this time. One of the last things he said was concern for the souls of people around him. And this was the passage that he declared. This passage famously is an invitation. And yet, just as famous are the excuses for not receiving the invitation. Um, I fully admit that I preached uh, this passage and this text um, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, I'm aware uh, of the familiarity of this text. I um, prayed this week, uh, really feel like I wrestled with the Lord in a spiritual sense as to what I would preach this morning. And with all that's going on, around the world i uh, thought should i preach on those things and then i was in second corinthians 12 a lot thinking about physical infirmity and god's grace being sufficient and and then i felt like the lord just kept bringing me back to this passage i do believe with all my heart that this is the passage that uh, god's people need to hear this morning uh, even though it is a passage uh, from which i have preached previously and it may be because God's people need to hear of the evils and the dangers of being excuse makers. But it also may be that there are some under the sound of my voice right now that don't know Jesus as their Savior. And I want to be an extension of Almighty God to offer you the invitation that's in this text. And my prayer is that you won't, at the conclusion of this service, you won't offer some kind of excuse but instead you'll receive the invitation and come to Christ this morning because heaven and hell hang in the balance. That was Moody's concern. Never have I wanted to lead men and women to Christ as much as I do at this time. And so I want us to consider this concept of being an excuse maker and specifically we will consider this text with this title. If you're a note taker, you could jot the title down and that is Excuses that lead to hell. Exclu excuses that lead to hell. That's what is found famously in 18, 19, and 20. Three excuses. One individual said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. And another said in verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen and I must go prove them. And then in verse number 20, I have married a wife and therefore they cannot attend the supper. It's excuses in the text. And and you understand that this text is a gospel invitation. Therefore, to reject the supper that is described in the early verses of the text is to consign one's soul to a devil's hell. The supper represents the forgiveness that's offered for sinners. Forgiveness offered only through Jesus. The supper represents grace. Amazing grace. The supper represents the mercy of Almighty God. Don't decline this invitation. Um, and so I want us to consider this morning, we'll consider 10 observations and principles that apply in both a secular and a sacred setting. Some of you say, Pastor, I'm already saved. I've already received God's invitation in relationship to my soul. Well, that's wonderful. If that's you, you're thankful for your salvation, would you say amen? Amen. But there is many other applications for you then uh, here this morning. I want to caution the church this morning about being an excuse maker, whether it's a spiritual excuse or it's some kind of earthly, uh, practical excuse. Because the truth is, if we fail and we are constant excuse makers, we will face consequences. I mean, think about practical things in your life where you know in your heart you're making excuses. Now, by way of introduction, I must say that there is a difference between excuses and reasons. Sometimes you have a valid reason for not participating in something, a valid reason for not accomplishing something. But more times than not, we really are just people making excuses. 
We fail to accomplish that which God really would intend us to accomplish. And consequences come, and sometimes those consequences are physical. Uh, many people, when they make New Year's resolutions, we um, have physical aspirations in mind, and then the excuses set in and we fail, and consequences come. Maybe we are excuse makers when it comes to relational things. We know our marriage should be this way, and we know Ephesians 5, and we know uh, how to raise our children and the work of parenting, but we have excuses, and there's relational consequence. And sometimes, and really the primary message of this text is, is spiritual consequences because of excuses, and, and the spiritual consequence leads to that which is damnable. Some of the saddest words in all the Bible include and in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. <clears throat> Ultimately, excuses can damn an individual to hell. Excuse makers end up fired sometimes from their job. They end up fat, you might say, just out of shape. They had a New Year's resolution but never accomplished it. They end up ultimately frustrated with the circumstances of their lives. And they've always got an excuse for why they never achieve. So let's consider this morning these 10 ideas from this text. Here's the first, and that is that life is easier without excuses. Notice with me verse number 17. This servant, uh, he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. All right, so it's verse 16 where a certain man made a great supper and bade many. So lots of people are invited. And notice verse number 17, that the supper is ready. Uh, it's like you can smell the food. It's, it would be an easy thing to just pull out the chair, sit at the table, and partake of the supper. That would be the Lord, the Master's will in this moment. However, we've read 18, 19, and 20, these that were bidden did not come to the supper. Instead, they chose a harder path, ultimately. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that the way of the transgressor is hard. You can be an excuse maker all you want with Almighty God, and all you're going to do is end up taking a more difficult road. Transgression is the idea of sin, similar to the word iniquity. The way of the transgressor is hard. God says, do this, and I invite you to do this. And sometimes he commands us to do this, and we say, no, 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 and we choose a very hard road. I'm saying that abundant life is so much better, church, than indulgent life. God's will is so much easier than self-will. Life is easier without excuses. The supper is already made and you have been invited, it's supper time. It's all ready. The work has been done. So sit down and partake. Receive the forgiveness. Receive the mercy. Receive the grace. Life is easier without excuses. Secondly, excuse makers can always find others to agree with them. Let that sink in for just a moment. Excuse makers can always find others to agree with them. Even if your excuse is lame, heinous, even irrational, some people will validate it. That's what's happening in verse number 18. Notice verse 18 of Luke 14. It says that they all with one consent began to make excuse. So it's not like the guy with the piece of ground, the, five, the other guy five yoke of oxen, and then the third guy who married a wife. It's not like they had individual thoughts on why they should be excused. Though they had individual excuses, the text says they came together with one consent. Like all three of them were like, nope, we're not going to the supper. What do you think? I don't want to go to the supper either. I mean, yeah, I know it's all prepared. I know the, the smell is in the air. The aroma is in the air. It smells good. It'd be easy to do that. No, 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 no. Let's each come up with our own excuses. Do you agree? Yep, I agree. With one consent, they began to make excuse. They found others to validate their cop-out, their lame excuses. It's similar to what happens in Genesis 11, famous Tower of Babel. The people there 
where the Bible says all one, they came together. They found others to agree with them. But in Genesis 11, they found others to agree with them in their defiance against God. Our world today, the world in which we live, it gets together and says, hey, let's all agree that we don't want God's will. That's what these three excuse makers represent. A defiant world, a carnal culture. Not only these two ideas, but here's a third one, and that is that excuses usually include some truth. Excuses usually include some truth. A little nugget of truth. We call it in the 21st century maybe a white lie. It's uh, just enough truth so that it's believable, but really there's deception involved and really a little bit of truth with some lie amounts to basically a whole lie. Uh, It amounts to deception and, and, and selfishness rooted in pride and arrogance. I mean, that's what's happening in these excuses, okay? With one consent, verse 18 says, they began to make excuse and the first one said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it that's probably true that he has a piece of ground the next fellow verse 19 probably true that he has five yoke of oxen verse number 20 probably true that he has a controlling wife okay little bit of truth in each of these declarations but but who buys a piece of ground that they haven't seen and and who buys oxen that they haven't proven or tested And again, yes, he probably did have a controlling wife. But I mean, you you just kind of track through these and you understand they just don't want to do what the master is bidding them to do. And so they're just thinking of whatever they can come up with to get out of it. A little bit of truth that ultimately is just nothing more than smoke and mirrors, selfishness, and essentially a lie. All right, a little bit of truth. What about the fourth idea? And that is that excuse makers are good at posturing. Posturing. Um, That's what's happening at the end of verse 18 and the end of verse 19. Notice the phrases twice in the text, I pray thee have me excused. So I'm not going to be able to make it to the supper. Um, and, And you know what you could do for me? Would you just pray for me? That's what they're saying posturing it's religious posturing uh you can almost imagine the body language in it you know uh where they kind of put their hands together like a prayerful position and kind of bow before the master i pray thee have me excused i mean they look really religious and they look somewhat humble um, but it's really just just religious piety that's sourced in selfishness it's posturing would you just pray for me? I pray for thee, have me excused. The word posturing, uh, it's, it's the idea of behavior that is intended to impress or mislead. That's what's happening. Excuse makers are good at posturing. Sometimes when, when we're guilty of making excuses, uh, we sell them really well. We, we purport it to be a reason and when in reality it's just an excuse. And we persuade the other people, no, this is really valid. That's what they're doing here. Not only these four, but here's a fifth one, and that is excuse-making causes work for others. If you live a life full of excuse for this and not accomplishing this and never got to that, and one of these days I'll do that, and you just never do it, your life is full of procrastination and some kind of noble-sounding justification that's really just hogwash, then what you're doing is you're causing work for others. That's what the text reveals. Notice how much work this servant is having to do in the passage. Verse number 17, notice the word servant. After the, 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 the supper was made, he sent his servant at supper time, okay, to say to them that are bidden, come. All these things are now ready. So the serpent then goes. And then verse 21 after 18 and 19 and 20 the bible lists the excuses what does the master do he dispatches the servant again in verse 21 notice the word servant and that servant came and showed his lord these things then the master of the house so so the servant says all these guys made excuses master okay lord lowercase l uh 
They all made excuses. So, so the servant is doing his job showing the master these things. Then the middle of verse 21, the master of the house being angry, not at his servant, but at the excuse makers, he says to his servant, go do more work. That's what he says. Go out, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. So he's already done some work in verse 17. He gets dispatched for more work in verse 21. Uh, then verse number 22, uh, the, the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, yet there is room. Then verse 23, the Lord said unto the servant, go do even more work. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that, that my house may be full, filled, the text says. Our constant habitual excuse-making causes work for others. Not only these five, but consider this sixth idea, and that is that excuse makers reveal the condition of their own heart. Now, I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of this text because what is contrasted with 18, 19, and 20, uh, contrasted with that range of verses with the poor the maimed and the halt and the blind is a disposition of individuals' hearts. Okay? So, so the poor, maimed, halt, and blind people, you know what they are? They're desperate-hearted people. I mean, the master says to the servant, go get some people that'll be uh, eager for food, eager for the supper, that are desperate to sit at this table. They will be excited about the banquet as opposed to the self-important people who had religious posturing and made up some excuses. Those people are self-important. They're arrogant in their heart. They're not desperate. They have an exaggerated sense of their own importance. So me and a couple of men from our church the last several weeks, sometimes three or four of us, have been out downtown Pensacola handing out gospel tracts, asking people, if you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Asking people things like, can we tell you about Jesus? Just giving out tracts. Um, and this last Thursday night we were there, and uh, those of us that were out all had the same conclusion at the end of the night. And that was that there were more people this particular week than previous weeks, more people that seemed to have a hard heart. Um, we had some gospel conversations this week. It's wonderful when you get to stand in downtown Pensacola in the middle of our mission field and talk through the gospel with people. It's a wonderful thing. Two weeks ago, Brother Butler led a man to the Lord right out there on the pier, about a 20-year-old man. Uh, wonderful that God used him in that way. But this last Thursday, we all kind of concluded, seemed like close to half the people we talked to, hey, can I give you, no, they say, and kind of had that self-important tone to them. Don't bother me, you know, maybe on their cell phone. Uh, down by the water, of course, a lot of people have boats and have uh, uh, an air about them of, you know, uh, 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 financial independence. And it did put me in mind of the idea that it is uh, easier for, to get a camel through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, just so independent. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. I don't need your little pamphlet full of Bible verses. Just seemed like there was just a spirit in the air where about half the people we approached just had a cold kind of tone to them. And that was our summary at the end. Um, and that summary is heartbreaking. I mean, the invitation in the text is for people that are desperate hearted. Uh, people that understand that they're a sinner and that, that their sin has, has affected them. You know, uh, these are people that are poor, spiritually speaking, and maimed, spiritually speaking, halt and blind. They're desperate hearted. I don't want to die and face the consequences of my own sin. So no longer will I make excuses. No, Jesus, you're inviting me to your supper. And so I'm going to say yes to your invitation. I'm saying that the condition of our heart is revealed if we're excuse makers. Not only that, but the seventh idea is this. Excuse making causes people that love you to be angry with you. And I think that's an interesting idea as well. 
Um, somebody said that the way to spell love, how do you spell love? I think it was Amy Carmichael who said, you spell love T-I-M-E. It's the idea of an investment of your time or the investment of your resources. There's love in this text. The love is seen in verse number 16, that a certain man made a great supper. It's an investment. There was time in the, the making of the great supper, and then there is more investment in the actual food and, and the table that was prepared. It's love. And notice the anger that develops then in verse number 21. Then the master of the house being angry. There's righteous indignation. That's in verse 21. You notice that that's on the heels of verses 18, 19, and 20, where these three guys are making their excuses. And righteous indignation flares up in the heart of the master. Anger, disappointment, frustration, you might say, a righteous kind of frustration. All this work. And I use the word work deliberately. So, um... I was saved. I received the invitation when I was nine. It was 1988. I was a, a, a nine-year-old boy. I received the invitation for heaven. I admitted that I was a sinner and I called on Jesus to save me. I understood that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, that there's good news there and I can live eternally with Jesus. I understood that as a boy. But there was a spiritual checkpoint time for me, kind of a rededication time for me. I was 12 years old. I grew up in the inner city of North Minneapolis, and I was looking at the sin in my life as a kid. And sometimes inner city kids feel like they grow up faster maybe than other kids because of all the stuff they get into and stuff that they see. And I was evaluating my own, own soul's condition. And I was like, there's no way that if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Because all this stuff, no way. It was a spiritual checkpoint. It was through tears. Uh, and I wasn't a churchgoer at the time. Didn't start going to church until just after that, that spiritual checkpoint in my life. But it was through tears where I realized that the gospel is not about my works, good or bad. It's about his work, perfect work for sinners such as us. The perfect work he did on the cross. So yeah, the work has been done. Jesus did it. He lived a sinless life so that he could offer salvation to sinful people. He went through the crucifixion. The, the way it says in Philippians 2 is even the death of the cross. He died that substitutionary death and took on the price that sinners like us deserve to pay. And he died like a common criminal. He did the work. The work has been done. And God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're thankful for that verse, say amen. amen. He wants all of us to receive his invitation. And, and takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, Exodus tells us. Uh, why? Uh, Ezekiel tells us. Why no pleasure in the death of the wicked? Why? Because it's eternal damnation for sinners. Um. Righteous indignation over rejecting the invitation. That's what the text is communicating. Not only these seven, but here's an eighth idea. And that is that if you don't want to enjoy the benefits, someone else will. Okay? So these guys, they said, no, we've got other things to do. And there was a place at the table, you know, for this this guy who had the piece of ground this is your seat sir and there's another place at this very well prepared table for the guy with the five yoke of oxen here's your seat sir and the guy who married a wife and had to go and see her there was a, a seat there somebody else sat in those seats somebody else enjoyed the benefits that had been prepared some maimed guy sat in the guy's seat that had the five yoke of oxen some desperate-hearted fellow sat in the seat of the guy that had, had ground that he had to go survey. If you keep up with these excuses, someone else will enjoy the benefits. These 
poor, maimed, halt, and blind individuals, these desperate-hearted people, they're eating the supper that, that you could have also partaken in. They're eating the banquet that you were supposed to attend. They are thriving while you are floundering because you're an excuse maker. And that might just be temporally excuse making on this earth or you might flounder, you might say, eternally in hell because of rejecting the invitation of Jesus. What about number nine? Number nine is excuse making always has consequences. And that's what verse 24 does for us. Verse number 24 explains the consequences. So uh, the, the, the passage here is, is really starts this, this parable that the Lord Jesus gives, starts in 15 and concludes in 24. And appropriately, it concludes with consequence for being an excuse maker. Verse 24, For I say unto you, the Master here is speaking, for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. I offered them an invitation. They rejected it. So now, no. Ladies and gentlemen, you can pick your excuses, but you can't pick your consequences. And the master said no to the fellow with the piece of ground. Okay, you want to be that way? No. No to Mr. I've got five yoke of oxen. No to Mr. I've married a wife. You can pick your excuses, but you can't pick your consequences. Not only these, but number 10. And that is that good servants are not excuse makers. Good servants are not excuse makers. I believe that the most underrated individual in this text is the servant. So... Um, in preparation for becoming a preacher, a lot of good colleges will teach uh, young preachers, they'll teach, things, teach them things about homiletics and teach them things about hermeneutics. And uh, the idea of homiletics is the idea of learning how to preach or declare the scripture, but hermeneutics is the interpretation of the scripture. Whenever you look at a passage of scripture, there's many rules in the hermeneutical world about interpreting the scripture correctly but the goal of a bible preacher is um is exegesis so you want to you want to explain the text essentially as opposed to eisegesis which is seeing things between the lines that aren't really there but proclaiming those things i want to ask you this question who are you in the text now that leads us to what what some people have called narcissus which is like seeing yourself in a text when you're not necessarily in the text. And that can be a very dangerous thing. Sometimes we read these biblical accounts and we're like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I, I'm definitely David when David killed Goliath. That is totally me. We never see ourselves as Goliath, okay? Even though many of us are probably, honestly, we're probably a lot more like the defiant Philistine than we are the heroic young boy with a lot of faith. We like to see ourselves in Scripture, and that can be a very dangerous thing. Narcissus, so, so narcissistic that we see ourselves on the pages of Scripture. So beware of that. But I would suggest that there, there are some applications that can be reasonably made from this text in relationship to who we are in the text. So who are we? Are we the master of the text? Absolutely not. Okay? That is a reference to the Lord. The Lord is the one extending the invitation. It's a gospel invitation. Um, are we the excuse makers in the text? Maybe. Maybe. Are you saved? Are you one of those people that is constantly saying no to God's invitation to you? At some point, there will be consequences if you keep up with this no, no, no stuff. Um, now, those of us that know what it means to be saved, you know who we are in the text? We, we, we used to be, before we got saved, we used to be the poor, the halt, the lame, and the blind. That's who we were before Christ in this text. But you know what? He's healed us. And if you know what it means to be saved, you know who you are in the text? You're the servant. And the master says to you, go and do this. And what do you say? You're a good servant. So you say, yes, Lord. 
He calls you to a mission field and you say, yes, Lord. He calls you to preach at a Baptist church in Pensacola and you say, yes, Lord. And, and wherever he calls you and however he instructs you to conduct yourself in whatever role he has called you uh, to, 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 to conduct yourself in. So I'm a husband. That's a role he has called me to. And I'm a father. And, and whatever the, the title you have, employee or employer, you want to be a good servant to your Lord. And so whatever he says about those roles, you say, yes, Lord. Good servants are not excuse makers. Oh, but it's hard. I mean, look at all the work the servant had to do. And he had to do more work because he was surrounded by excuse makers. And yet, good servants are not excuse makers. No, why? Because they share the master's heart. If we're going to be good servants, we have got to know the master's heart. And this is how you get to know our master's heart. Hide God's word in your heart. We might not sin against him. Good servants are not excuse makers because they share the master's heart. Good servants get stuff done, not for their own glory, but for the glory of their master. It's interesting as you look at this servant. This servant is the kind of servant I definitely want to be. Verse number 22, notice it says that the servant said, Lord, it is done. Now this is after he's already done all this work of preparing this meal, all this work of inviting people, He's went through the drama of the excuse makers. Now we're in verse 22 and he says, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. He's already gone out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city to bring in, in, in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. So we're in 22. Lord, it is done. When you're a servant and you're serving others, and you're serving humbly, not for your glory, but for theirs, don't you like it when you're done? <laughs> it's done as you have commanded. You commanded me, I'm your servant, you're my master. And, and so see the humility in that, the obedience in the first phrase there in verse 22. But notice at the end of 22, he gives an update. I've done all the things the master said, and yet there is room. Sometimes it takes a bit of extra gumption to give that update because you know when you update the master in this way, it's very likely going to be even more work still for you as the servant. Yet there is room. And sure enough, what happens in 23 is the Lord says to the servant, go and do more work. And, and, and some of us would be tempted to kind of not give that update because it's done. What you've commanded me to do is already done. That's why I think the servant is so underrated in this text. We read this and we think about the master and the meal and we think about the excuse makers. Maybe we think more about the, the poor, halt, lame, blind people. But this servant, and, and that's why he's underrated. He doesn't want to be well known. He wants his master to get all the glory. Good servants are not excuse makers. This passage of scripture showcases the character of true servants of Christ. So the invitation for you, dear Christian, is that you would say, whatever God wants me to do, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop with excuses. It's going to probably lead me out of my comfort zone. But as a Christian, you've already saved my soul. Now it's my Romans 12, 1, reasonable service, the logical thing to do to present my body a living sacrifice to you. All right, that's the application for Christians. But for those of you that have been thinking, I mean, you're here at Northstone Baptist Church, or maybe you're watching the live stream, you've thought enough about your soul to, to log on or to gather here, but you know in your heart you don't have a Bible reason why you have a home in heaven. You've never received the good news of Jesus. And you sit here this morning realizing, I don't want to reject the invitation. I don't want to be an excuse maker. I say to you, there's a seat at the table with your name on it. Will you, RSVP, will you accept Jesus' invitation? And I stand here privileged to be an extension of that invitation. Will you receive Christ today before it's eternally too late? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please?